Hi, everyone. Welcome. Thank you for joining us for this session of the Faculty of Arts and Social Sciences Virtual Open Day and Pre Expo. My name is Funibert Semgai. I'm a third year student studying PhD studies in international relations under the Faculty of Arts and Social Sciences. And my name is Ms. JT Kekea, and I'm a tutor under the Department of PNG Studies and International Relations. I graduated last year with Divine Art University, and it has been a pleasure working here again at this university that I've spent four years studying in. Okay, so on behalf of the Faculty of uh, Arts and Social Sciences, we would like to welcome all our attendees who are participating our year three and fours who have joined us. We would also like to welcome the audience that have joined us on the Facebook live stream. We are very thankful and we are very glad that you have joined us for this afternoon. It will be very informative for everyone in this case, for all the parties involved, and we are very looking forward to this session. And we would like to give a warm welcome to our guest speakers, our partners who have joined us today for this session. And Without further ado, we'll move on with our program for today. Okay, so the whole purpose of this open day is to, um, to adapt to the new times where we have the pandemic coming in and our university is just trying to adapt to the new changes that have come up. So in this case, uh, we're trying to get our students to be more exposed with the industries of what the industries expect of us and also how the university can uh, help our students get ready for the industries. And along the way, there will be short pre-recorded videos that will be helpful to the community to learn more about DivineWord and how potential students and also stakeholders will learn more about how they can help DivineWord or join DivineWord. So without further ado, let's go on with it. My name is Philip Gibbs and I'm president of Divine Word University in Papua New Guinea. Welcome to Open Day at Divine Word University. Open days are a common feature at universities as a chance for the public to visit and learn about what the university offers and also as a career expo, an opportunity for potential students to learn more about life at the university. This year Due to restrictions imposed by the coronavirus pandemic, we can't have crowds of people milling around on our campus. So we've decided to have a virtual open day, utilizing the great resources we have here in information technology. It is with that modern technology that I'm able to speak with you now. Throughout the whole of today, for the next eight hours, the faculties and other groups from Divine Word University will have an opportunity in webinars through Zoom and streamed on Facebook to tell you more about life here, respond to your questions and engage with many of our important stakeholders and industry partners. We will be starting off with a virtual tour of several of the campuses, giving you a chance to look at some of the spaces and meet people you would experience here as a visitor. Divine Word University evolved from the Divine Word Institute in 1996. Today the university is a national university with five campuses in various parts of Papua New Guinea. DWU is ecumenical with a Catholic ethos, privately governed and co-educational. DWU aspires to be a national university, open to all, serving society through the quality of its teaching, learning, research and community service in a Christian environment. It offers a chance to those interested in improving themselves spiritually and intellectually so that they may become responsible citizens and contribute positively to the development of society. Students come from all 22 provinces of Papua New Guinea and from abroad, including Solomon Islands. The university aims to turn out graduates with the skills required for national development, 
as well as professionals who will provide Christian leadership for the nation. Professional ethics learned at DWU will hopefully stay with graduates throughout their working lives. At the end of their courses, and for most that means four years, students attend a missioning ceremony with each final year student receiving a special missioning cross as a constant reminder of the transformation they will have experienced while here. In a country with very high levels of gender-based violence, DWU has a special interest in encouraging women to take an active part in national life and in improving the status of women in society. Of more than 1,700 students currently enrolled at the Medang campus, more than half are women. A similar structure applies in other campuses as well. DWU has four faculties, Business and Informatics, Arts and Social Sciences, Medicine and Health Sciences, and Education. We will be hearing more from the faculties during the day. The theme for this year, 2021, comes from one of the early Divine Word missionaries who was missing to China, Joseph Ranadimitz. We remember him as saying, the language that all people understand is that of love. That is our underlying theme for today. Welcome to Open Day at Divine Word University. and welcome to Divine Word University. I am Aisha Mangot, a third year student studying Communication Arts Journalism. Today, I will be giving you a tour of our Medan campus. Come along and let me show you around. As soon as you enter the university gate, the first thing you will notice is the Friendship Library. When I first came here to study, I was blown away by the amazing architect design of this building. The library contains so many different books. One of the best thing about this library is that it also has modern cataloging software. And that's not all. Upstairs you will find the Nosa Library, which was named after the late Archbishop of Mede, Adolf Nosa. The main objective of NOSA Library is to support research in all areas related to Papua New Guinean studies. As soon as you exit the library, right across the road, you will notice the beautiful Alumni Park. You may wonder why it's called the Alumni Park. Well, come along and let me show you. Each year, Divine Road University awards alumni for their outstanding contribution towards society and professionalism. These are some of the alumni that contributed towards society and professionalism. On campus, we also have a chapel where students have access to pastoral care. As small as this building may look, this is the heart of online learning here in Divine Word University, the Information Communication Technology Center. This is where you will find Center for Learning and Teaching. Center for Learning and Teaching provides support to faculties in Divine Word University in their professional development, academic performances, and transformative educational experiences with technology. And here we are at 
the Student Services Building, where students can seek assistance for transportation, accommodation, and other student matters. One of the best things about our campus is that it provides convenient services that are accessible on campus, such as the Global Travel Center. As a student living away from home, I am glad that there is a clinic on campus with dedicated nurses and doctors. The campus has an ATM machine that's open 24 hours a day, a mat that provides essential items for the community. We also have a cozy little cafe on campus known as the D Cafe, where you can find delicious cakes, muffins or just a cup of coffee. We also participate in sport activities on and off campus. We have sport field for rugby, netball, basketball, volleyball, soccer, and a tennis court. One of the best things about our university is that it has great community spirit with friendly staff and students. For more information about our Divine World University's Medan campus and its other campuses, visit our website on www.dw.ac.pg. Back, we will now have a message from the Faculty of Arts and Social Sciences. Dean, uh, Prof Associate Professor, Sister Miriam Douglas. Hello, I am Sister Miriam Douglas. As a Dean, I overlook smooth running of the Faculty of Arts and Social Sciences which is one of the four faculties of the Weinberg University. With great joy, I welcome everyone to the 2021 Virtual Divine World University Open Day. Welcome all our stakeholders, our friends, our staff members, students, and all who accepted the invitation to connect with us today. The vision of the Faculty of Arts and Social Sciences is a multidisciplinary faculty in the quest for excellence in learning, committed to producing quality graduates for the 21st century. The faculty includes four departments. Department of Communication Arts, Journalism, Department of Papua New Guinea Studies in, and International Relations, Department of Social and Religious Studies, and Department of Governance and Leadership in Flexible Mode. The faculty offers undergraduate degrees as well as master's and doctoral studies which can be undertaken on full-time basis or off campus in a distant mode. By offering both components, theory and practice, all four departments aim to prepare graduates with thorough knowledge in their field, as well as knowledge of technology and the use of quality equipment professional skills related to their training, as well as abilities to identify and analyze various issues related to development. One of the primary contributions of journalists to democracy and sustainable development is the world to report and monitor abuses to democratic processes, to foster transparency, accountability, and the rule of law. Media coverage 
can also help democracy, advance gender equality, and sustainable development. Bachelor of Papua New Guinea Studies and International Relations is a unique degree, not only nationwide, but worldwide as well. It prepares the graduates for a career on a local, provincial or national level that bridges out to various fields. Some of our graduates are working with different NGOs, with government organizations or with the Department of Foreign Affairs and International Trade. Bachelor of Arts in Religious Studies and in Social Work programs were created in response to the urge coming from the Conference of the Catholic Bishops of Papua New Guinea and Solomon Islands. Therefore, since 2019, the Department of Social and Religious Studies offers these two streams. The, name, the aim of the programs is to create professionals who are qualified to exert transforming influence in the society through academic teaching, community engagement, and social action. Beside the program framed within curriculum, the students are encouraged to participate, to participate in extracurricular sessions geared towards students' transformation. Besides, Christian ethics values are integrated to the courses. Graduates are trained as competent professionals to become outstanding Christian leaders, able to make personal contribution to the growth of our nation. The Faculty of Arts and Social Sciences graduates are formed to stay in touch with the reality in order to bring about the visible change. Be people oriented, open to all, and standing for the rights of those who are excluded from the rights, who are voiceless, trained how to identify and analyze social issues, they are attuned to the PNGs as well as global issues, such as gender-based violence, injustice, climate changes, deforestation, protection of environment, etc. All of these attitudes, all of these values are attuned to the topic of our open day. The language that all people understand is that of love. Thank you, Sister Miriam Douglas, for the message. And now, I think it's time for the students to tell you about their own departments. So let's head on over to what the students' video has, uh, the students has prepared for us. Hi there, my name is Thea Badjuan Wok and I am a final year student undertaking a bachelor's degree in social and religious studies. I chose to study this program because I really want to make a difference in this nation by helping people who cannot help themselves. People who come from broken families, people who come from bro broken communities, people who are marginalized and people who are denied 
from their rights. Social and Religious Studies is a four-year program that offers various knowledge and skills that will create professionals who will bring positive influence into the society. Students who take this program are, are trained on how to address some of the worst social issues in the society using a high level of critical thinking and problem solving skills. Students are taught on how to improve their lives and improve their communities and fight for social justice. The graduates from Social and Religious Studies Department are worth hiring because with our skills and knowledge, we also value the human dignity and the worth of a person. We value human relationships, we value integrity, and we value competency. During the holidays, the students have the opportunity to do part-time jobs as volunteers in both government and non-government organizations, but especially the non-government organizations. This helps them to build their skills, knowledge, and experiences on a more practical basis. The department and the faculty are doing this through its quality learning and teaching by giving the students the chance to take part in community engagement programs and by social research which every student take. This helps the students gain a lot of skills, experience and knowledge to prepare them for the real world. A Bachelor of Arts degree in Papua New Guinea Studies and International Relations has a nice name to it, has a nice ring to it. Ladies and gentlemen, I am Tema Elliott, a third year student in currently studying under the Department of PNG Studies and International Relations. Besides academic excellence, I chose Divine Way University because of the Christian values and moral ethic conducts that it integrates to teach its students and focuses on holistically developing its students to face the real world. My department, PNG Studies and International Relations, offers a variety of study areas that include politics, economics, history, culture, and international relations of many levels. In the department, there are four strands that the program covers. We have culture studies, community development, politics, and international relations. So under these four strands, we have units that, or other topics that come out, that branch out in which we undertake studies. Now, along as we go through the stage of studying, undergraduates develop skills being critical thinkers and analytical thinkers they identify issues that are faced in Papua New Guinea in today modern day PNG now with this knowledge that they gain and then analytical skills and critical thinking skills they have they are able to conceptualize and better understand why these issues are present and how they can best deal with them. So this program gives you options that you can explore more so than any other course. Hello everyone, my name is Bradley Paliai and I am a communication arts and generation year three student. The department offers a program in um, a bachelor program in communication arts and communication arts journalism, which takes a uh, four years. Uh, and I assure you, over the course of the four years, our communication arts students are taught various uh, communication skills and are exposed to the uh, theories and practical components and practical components relating to the various topics in the media now communication arts does not is not only centered around journalism but we also study the uh, communication models and communication theories 
and we also look at uh, several different uh, development theories also. And at the end, when the communication arts, our communication arts students, they graduate, they're able to critically analyze the various uh, issues relating to development in Papua New Guinea. We also do hands-on uh, work with, uh, with whatever we do, like as in uh, small assignments and activities. We, the students, we get a hands-on grip on, like we use the cameras, we use drones, the drones, the cameras, all of these things are meant by us. Uh, usually during the week, uh, we get we, some of our students, they go out, they go collect news and they, you know, give it to the several, uh, the mainstream media. It's not only on the print, but also on in television. So the reason why I chose uh, communication arts is that I was really captivated by what the course offered in terms of what the students do like um, they were more more on the ground and doing the doing what they were doing as in terms of journalism helping people reporting on stories and reporting on real issues within the community but not only theory but you know they we, they, we were doing practical work and when i came into uh, communication and journalism we were out there reporting on issues that were real in terms of helping the community and stuff like that Hi there, my name is Yanila Rokamako. I am a 2014 graduate of the Vineyard University in the Social and Religious Studies program. The Social and Religious Studies program is one that is designed to meet the development needs of such a country like Papua New Guinea and my imagination of Bougainville. Since graduating from the Vineyard University, I have held different capacities in government, community and peace building on Bougainville. The work that I do is very much shaped by that training I received from Social and Religious Studies program. The biggest achievement of my career is establishing my own education and counseling center in Panguna. This center is now the leading education and counseling center in the district with programs ranging from early childhood, adult literacy, teacher training and development, research, curriculum, development and counseling, just to name a few. Because of my engagement with the community, I was pushed to contest politics in the 2020 Autonomous Bougainville Government General Elections. I am now the political representative of Euro constituency and I have been appointed as the Minister for Education in the Autonomous Bougainville Government. And now I look after the entire development of education in the soon-to-be nation of Bougainville. I find that social and religious studies program has enabled me to be productive and creative in my work. Looking after education, the legislation and development of this important entity is not an easy task. I now carry the responsibility of developing education and designing and defining our curriculum as Bougainville draws near to nationhood. My name is Rolling Phil Sidika, second Kanoa in province, and I am a journalist with the European Genius Broadcasting Corporation. I've been with the organization for the last 15 years. I first entered the Vineyard University in 2004 as a first year journalism student and graduated in 2006 with a diploma in communication arts. After working for six years, I re enrolled for further studies and finally graduated in 2015 a bachelor's degree in communication arts. My advice to upcoming aspiring journalists would be it's a challenging world out there. You, you have to be emotionally and mentally strong to face the challenges at work. Take time to educate yourself on domestic, 
national and global issues so you are able to think critically and, and you are able to analyze information for public consumption. Currently, I'm the director of uh, NBC Environment and I look up to 13 staff. So my primary role is to manage and lead the station and manage the 13 staff that work at home. Welcome back. That's the message from the three departments under the Faculty of Arts and Social Sciences. Uh, we will move on to the one, the last department that is under the Faculty of Arts and Social Sciences, that's the Department of Governance and Leadership. Before we move on to a message from the Dean of Governance and uh, the HOD of Governance and Leadership, Mrs. Lauren Mullin, I would like to thank the participants who have joined us on Zoom, 60 plus participants, and our audiences that are watching live on Facebook, 70 plus audiences. Thank you so much. You can ask your um, questions. If you have any questions for the guest speakers that will be speaking today, please to the participants joining us live on Facebook, you can um, comment your questions in the comment section below on the Divine Red University Facebook page. And to our participants joining us live on Zoom, you can ask your questions in the chat box below. So without further ado, Mrs. Lauren Molly. Hello, my name is Lorraine Molin, and I am the head of department for the Department of Governance and Leadership. The Department of Governance and Leadership is one of the uh, four programs um, under the Faculty of Arts and Social Sciences. The University, or the Divine World University, commits itself to offering programs in flexible learning mode to meet the needs of uh, employees that are uh, working full-time and cannot commit themselves to full-time studies. And so under the Department of Governance and Leadership, we have um, actually seven programs four of which are owned by the university and three um, conducted in partnership with uh, industry um, partners. Of the seven programs, our four programs are the Master of Public Administration, the Master of Leadership in Development, the Bachelor of uh, Public Administration and the Diploma in Project Management. We hope to introduce the Bachelor in Project Management in the near future. For more information on our programs, you can visit our website or you can call the Flexible Learning Center or myself directly on my email address showing on your screen. Okay, so that was a message from the HUD of Governance and Leadership. We will now have a video from the students of Governance and Leadership, specifically from the Bachelor's Program of Public Administration. My name is uh, Bon Andrew. My name is Rose Yadanama. I'm Japalis Kayok. I'm self-employed. I've been working in the Eastern Islands for more than 20 years. I did my diploma in project management and graduated in 2010. And this is my second time around doing my bachelor's in um, public administration. A bachelor's degree in public admin. Uh, because uh, I feel that uh, I need to acquire this uh, knowledge in order for me to you know, seek for employment opportunities within uh, the government department and organizations so that uh, I can, whatever I learned out of this, can bring some kind of uh, changes uh, into the organizations that uh, I would be required. I've realized the Divine Word has, has become main hub of the uh, of one of the main learning, learning institutions in the country, uh, whereby 
uh, Divine Word provides multi-discipline courses uh, through flexible mode and uh, that fits the gaps of both government and churches in terms of uh, acquiring additional knowledge and skills and applications to perform public services. I decided to apply to study at Divine Word University uh, because of its flexibility, uh, the lecturers and the other staffs are very friendly here and they're very flexible in our studies. The, the quality, of, quality of the units that we're going through in this institution, I think, um, I have realized that uh, there's some of them which I was not able to, you know, acquire during my other attendance of, uh, at uh, colleges and schools. But uh, I find some really be beneficial stuff that uh, I have I have learned. And though this is my towards the end of the third semester, I will be looking forward to my fourth semester. But I believe that uh, I will be well equipped after completion of my uh, the, the entire program. Uh, and when I learned about the uh, flexible mode for management, I first of all came for the uh, diploma management studies in Divine Word. That was my first first study. Um, after the study, the study has helped me to address all administrative and management issues of the organization. And after that, I also came to realize that I need to know the government sectors in terms of the directives and role, roles, rules and regulations and, and all that. And so I decided to come again for the public administrative studies because uh, uh, those were the uh, needed acquired knowledge and skills that I needed to know uh, in order to uh, cause influence, productivity, helping to also make service deliverables in the health system. I have seen and seen that um, these courses have really broadened my knowledge and uh, my understanding of how um, especially to um, assist um, my the organizational um, goals and to be productive in whatever that I am doing in a given organization. If you're a working class, you will report to work and then you will be allowed to come for the studies for two weeks for this program and then the uh, rest of the time they provide the course materials information uh, through email so you can stay wherever you are at your workplace or wherever and you can do your studies and do assignments, assignments and uh, do, you know, do presentations and then at the same time you can also post your assignment, assignment through emails. Uh, so there's the flexibility there and uh, which I think it's an opportunity for especially working class people uh, so that they don't have the full time to attend courses but I think this program which uh, Divine World is running I think it's, it is more convenient for especially working class people so they can have some time uh, in doing residential and uh, non-residential studies as well. Uh, in any sector at all in the, in the country, uh, in the government, in the church, in, the, in any other organizations, in the business sectors, uh, Divine Wood is providing this very uh, multidiscipline courses whereby it fits the gaps of acquiring knowledge, skills and attitude to improve service deliveries where, wherever there is. And I would really appreciate and uh, like say thank you also uh, on behalf of the organization and as well as a personal and a personal note. Thank you. now have our first uh, guest speaker for today, who will be talking to us today, um, Dr. Eliza Ropa. She manages the theology program in PNG and Solomon Islands in the Institute of Sisters of Mercy in Australia and PNG. Thank you very much. I will just share my PowerPoint with you. Um, I can't share that until you turn off your sharing, please.
Thank you. So good afternoon, everyone. My name is Dr. Alyssa Roper, and I'm the manager of the program of theology in Papua New Guinea and the Solomon Islands. This program is a partnership between the Sisters of Mercy, who run the program and provide staff, and the Divine Word University. We are really pleased to be a part of the Department of Governance and Leadership, which, as you heard, enables our students to study in a flexible mode. We offer a diploma in pastoral ministry, which is followed by an advanced diploma in theology and pastoral ministry, and we will in the future offer a degree in theology and ministry. The goal of the program is to offer excellent theological education to women in Papua New Guinea and the Solomon Islands. We offer units in theology and pastoral ministry. It is important to us that the PNG and Solomon Island cultural contexts are core to every aspect of the program. And this is one of my favourite images. It's from one of our liturgy classes. So I'd like to share with you the attributes that a student who has graduated with a dip past min has developed. They, they will demonstrate sound foundational skills for critical study of Christian and related texts. They demonstrate the ability to articulate foundational theological and scriptural knowledge and reflection. They exhibit clear analytical skills and that allowing them to analyze and communicate sound theological arguments. They apply their skills and knowledge to their own and other contexts and traditions, apply their skills and knowledge to the service of others through practical engagement and in contexts such as conversation. Critically evaluate their own engagement in ministerial activities and share responsibility for the achievement of group outcomes. We run classes where our students live and work. Mount Hagen, WeWAC, Port Moresby and Honiara. Our units are offered as intensive classes of nine days so that our students don't have long breaks in their ministries. The program of theology was designed to meet the needs of Catholic women religious or sisters for theological education, specially tailored for their pastoral ministries and cultural context. We will continue to work hard with our stakeholders to determine how the program can develop in the future to serve different groups of women. Over the six years we have run classes, we have had 134 women participate and 42 women have graduated with a diploma in pastoral ministry after successfully completing eight units. Our students use what they've learned in their pastoral ministries and in service to their communities, church and society. I would like to share some words now from Sister Marie Therese Jerombu. She's a Rosary Sister from WeWAC, who has graduated with a diploma and is a current student in the Advanced Diploma Program. Um, this black course now all sisters here come now giving me blood long um, me blood feeling more same this black course I'm helping me blood sisters now to me feeling more same this black course I'm coming helping to all um Narbla all all Papua New Guineans too long look seven understanding because all kind of something we blood make him now I'm all same give me my sabi look papa True, true, la bilipla mi plan, 
na holin pili pla mi bla strong na dem mi bla sem ki sem sabe bla dis pla ground em i can come na stab on top na pili pla mi bla e mas strong na sabe i come na by sabe i can come down fast when they believe na mi bla can come up on can walk man mary long country bla mi bla pam bla mi kim ti system long way for but god like mi bla long walk him come up him could bla something inside long help him all people bla mi bla So thank you for listening and thank you to the Divine Word University and the Faculty of Arts and Social Sciences for today. It's a great pleasure for us to be a partner program with them. And I think it's a great pleasure for our students to be a part of Divine Word University as well. So thank you, True. Can I ask a question? Can I ask the question? Is that a question for me, Sister Miriam? <laughs> yes, it is question for you, Elisa. I would like you to give us a little background story. What was the original idea for coming up with this wonderful course? First of all, I really congratulate for your sharing now, and I thank you that you wanted to join us in this open day. One thing that really intrigues me is that you have taken care for the religious women who for years have been a bit neglected, if I compare with seminaries and the, the male religious men. Could you share with us the original idea. Why this group of people? Thank you, Sister Miriam. Um, I'd be delighted. Um, I'm, I'm really proud to be uh, an em employed by the Sisters of Mercy. Um, and it was one of the, uh, several Sisters of Mercy who in Australia realized that their sisters in Papua New Guinea um, would really benefit from theological education in the same way that, that they themselves had. But it was really important to them that, um, that this was very culturally appropriate, that it, we weren't just giving them Australian education, but giving them PNG education and helping them to be PNG sisters. So um, the sisters travelled to PNG and spoke to different people, as we call them, our stakeholders. So they spoke to sisters, they spoke to leaders and to, um, to also uh, Bishop Doug Young of Mount Hagen um, to gauge what the need was and maybe what the reception would be and were delighted by uh, the very affirming um, yes from, from those people. So um, thus began some pilot programs and a little bit of background work. And then finally, wonderfully, a partnership with the Divine Word University. So at the moment, our teachers come from Australia. They are marvellous women theologians who are very well known in their areas. They might be biblical scholars, Trinity scholars. Um, I'm delighted myself. I've offered a sacraments unit recently. And they fly over and they teach the women in their local areas. Um, but our aim in the future is for our PNG women to have enough education and some experience and some guidance and mentoring to step up. And this will be really their program. Thank you very much. Congratulations to your program. And we as FAST faculty are very proud to have you and to accredit from the Divine Word University to the women religious. Thank you to the Mercy Sisters uh, whom you represent and you also are at this moment the facilitator, I understand, of the COPS. Congratulations and once more, thank you very much. Maybe students or others would like to have a question as well. Thank you so much, Sister Miriam. And of course, um, we can be contacted if, if people want more information through the de Department of Governance and Leadership or through that email address that I had on my screen. 
uh, theologycmsl at ismapng.org.au. And we're really pleased to be with DWU. So thank you. Once again, thank you, Dr. Roper, for being here with us today. Uh, we will move on to a three minute break. Before we move on, I would like to once again, thank all our participants for joining us today, this afternoon, and those who are watching us live on Facebook. Thank you. If you have any questions for Dr. Roper on Facebook, you may comment in the um, comment section on um, the DW Facebook page. For attendees watching on Zoom, if you have any questions, you can just ask them through the chat on Zoom. And we will be sharing the Facebook link to the DW Facebook page on the chat for those who do not have access to the Divine Road University Facebook page. For later, you can vote for um, FASS on our Facebook page. Without a further ado, we'll move on to a three minute break. Hello, my name is Jimmy Myronji, coordinator of Flexible Learning Center, Medan Campus. The center was established in 2013 as an alternate pathway for offering tertiary education to working class officers who are unable to enroll full time due to work commitment and personal reason. The FLC provides an excellent opportunity for upgrading knowledge, skills, and qualification. So we have four faculties, Faculty of Arts and Social Science, Faculty of Education, Faculty of Medicine and Health Sciences, Faculty of Business and Informatics, with a total of 22 programs. So to be eligible for the program, admission requirements, diploma programs, applicants should hold a greater certificate or matriculation qualification, have minimum of three years work experience or self-employment. For bachelor program, applicants should hold a diploma in management or re related field and have a minimum of three years work experience or self-employment. For master's program, applicants should hold a bachelor degree in business management or related field and have a, at least two years work experience in business or self-employment. PhD programs, applicants will normally have completed a master degree with an average grade of distinction or higher. English writing skills are a concern and applicants may be asked to demonstrate this before being accepted. So apart from DWFLC Medan campus, we have Port Mosby campus, Tabubil campus, and Weaver campus. So our dedicated team ensure that all logis logistic support is given to the participants when they travel in for the resident component of two to three weeks. Thank you very much. Welcome back, everyone. So for the next bit of this session, we'll be joined by industry partners from that are from that are connected to the Genji Studies and International Relations Department. Our first industry partner representative is Miss Loretta Hasso. So Miss Hasso is currently working with the PNG National Museum. Uh, she's a former lecturer of the PNG Studies and International Relations Department. However, prior to work to being a lecturer here, she worked with the PNG National Museum, and now she's back at the uh, PNG National Museum. And we would like to thank you and welcome you, Ms. Hassel. Hello, JT. Hello, Kunibe. I'm afraid I think my camera has a little bit of problem. 
Okay, so I'll better start. So let me give a big um, brief background about the National Museum before I go into partnership thing with the PNG, PNG Studies and International Relations Department. The PNG National Museum and Arts Gallery is a cultural institution in PNG that is responsible for promoting, preserving, and protecting PNG's unique cultural and contemporary heritage for the benefit of the old and the young generations of PNG. The museum or the National Museum and Arts Gallery is a spiritual house, you can say, of PNG and a home to nations, rich natural and cultural heritage. The museum is basically owned by the people of PNG and has artifacts from all 22 provinces of the country itself. So the museum itself was a gift from Australia um, as a, an independent um, gift presented to the newly nation state of PNG. So it was erected in 1975 and opened by the Queen, Queen Elizabeth in 1977. I work here as the manager responsible for museum education. For well, the title I hold basically is manager access education and public programs. So the brands itself is responsible for ensuring that the museum's experience or expertise, collections, and other related information are used to satisfy the educational and recreational needs of the community and in the areas of natural and cultural heritage. So apart from these brands itself, the museum itself has other branches, for example, modern history responsible for collections from the war and other collections from um, the colonial era. It also has collections from contemporary arts like for example, paintings from artists, not only paintings, we also have um, movies and other um, audio recordings as well. Apart from that, we also have collections from um, Royal Division responsible for prehistory. And prehistory in includes more or less um, items or oral history that predates history, what was written down prior to that. So mostly archeological stuff. We also have anthropology brands that is responsible for mostly ethno um, ethnographic collections that the museum has. And apart from that, we have corporate planning, um, human resource, conservation, I'm not forgetting that we also have a um, museum based in Goroka, JK McCarthy Museum. The museum itself, um, we are excited to provide industrial training for the PGIR students. And we may also extend to probably include tourism in the, in the future as well, especially in terms of um, industrial training, a space where they can come and um, get some experience about what life is out there in the workforce. So on behalf of the museum, um, we are very much excited to include the PGR students in the next, um, towards the end of the year, maybe early next year, dep depending on um, our arrangement with the PGIR. HOD and, and the lecturers, but we are excited to provide industrial training avenue for students who'd like to venture into areas of the museum itself. I think with that, um, 
can pass off from me unless there are any questions or comments from anybody out there, including students. Thank you very much, Ms. Hasu. Um, thank you very much. As a student, I am very looking forward to what you have mentioned uh, about the, the PNG National Museum working alongside the Department of PNG Studies and International Relations. Mm -hmm. we're, look, we're really looking forward to this. Now, moving on to our, our next representative. Uh, his name is Mr. Jude Roa. He's joining us from the Department of Foreign Affairs and International Trade, or more commonly known, the DFATE. So Mr. Roa, Roa is an alumni of the PNG, PNG Studies and International Relations Department. He represents a number of our graduates who have been employed by DFATE, and he is the product of the International Relations Strand Unit that has taught in the Bachelor of PNG Studies and International Relations Program. Welcome, Mr. Roa. Uh -huh. Thank you very much. Uh, good afternoon to both of you and all the other uh, participants. Um, sorry, I'm also having problem with my webcam as well, but um, I'll proceed on with my presentation. And uh, good afternoon, everyone. Um, ladies and gentlemen, on behalf of the Secretary of the Department of Foreign Affairs, I am glad and honored to be here today to present to you about the Department of Foreign Affairs and International Trade. Um, for those who do not know me, my name is Mr. Jutroa. I am attached with the department under the International Organization of Brands in the department. And my presentation will briefly focus on the structure and roles of the department, and then concluded with my experience with the department. And to do with the structure of the department, the structure of the department is determined by the level of relationship uh, PNG has with its uh, development partners. The department is headed by the secretary and supported by two deputies, uh, both policy and the operation. They provide policy support and operational support to the department. And also we have seven different uh, divisions uh, divided into two categories of policy and operation, and their function is also same by giving support to the secretary and the minister of uh, foreign affairs. The department also take into account uh, 21 overseas missions abroad, headed by the ambassadors, high commissioners, and uh, the affairs. They all report directly to the secretary of the department. Through secretary, the policy divisions of the department, they provide adequate advice and information to appropriate government agencies throughout the country for federal assessment and imp implementation aligned to the government national priorities and policies. And that's to do with the structure. And my experience with the department, first of all, uh, it is an honor to be a former PGIR student. I duly acknowledge the effort and commitment from lecturers like Mr. Warren Kuyas, Mr. Bennett Diegora, Father Pet, uh, Ms. Uh, Leo Baptist uh, for their support and commitment where I learn a lot and it prepares me very well to undertake my professional career. Working with the department is one of the best experience you would hope for and not to mention the pay. Um, you're exposed to meeting various people of different fields, characters, races, and countries. You would have the privilege to tour the world with the expectation of protecting your country's national interests, as well as serving as a diplomat one day in other countries. Having stated that, uh, there are challenges everywhere, but being a trained foreign service officer, you have to embrace it and move forward. And to conclude my um, presentation, um, I have a short message for everyone and that's to do with what's happening in the country. First and foremost, uh, we must all fight against gender-based uh, domestic violence in all forms and empower our women in the country because they contribute to the nation building. I think that's all from me and if anyone has any question, 
I am um, ready to answer, but um, I just want to inform everyone that it will depend on, uh, um, given that foreign affairs, we have certain protocols. There are some issues which I'm not allowed to answer, and some I will. But thank you all for your participation, and I am ready to answer any question uh, from any interested uh, participants. Thank you. Uh, as a student of PNG Studies and International Relations, I am very happy that an alumni of the department can be here to speak with us. And to the attendees, uh, we'll have time for one or two questions, which we can ask to uh, Ms. Hasu or Mr. Roa. Uh, the participants will include staff or students. You're more, well, more than welcome to uh, raise your hand or comment in the chat section. So you can get to know more about the Department of Foreign Affairs and International Trade or about the PNG National Museum. <laughs> Question for Ms. Hasu by one of our students. Uh, she's yep. asking uh, if you can see it on your end. She is asking. Yep, uh, okay. Um, thank you, Stephanie, for that question. So basically with regard to industrial training, so um, being with the background, coming from Divine Word, um, most students have expressed concerns of not having um, job experiences, and there's a need for job training. So based on that, um, we've actually in progress of coming up with a partnership agreement so that um, the PGIR department provide to us what is um, what they can do in regard to say internship training of students. So with regard to say industrial training, yeah, basically yeah. we provide that opportunity where students can come and do industrial training with us. But the requirements of, of what is expected and criteria and stuff has to come from PGIR. But whoever wishes to um, be, or to whoever wishes to be, um, involved in some sort of job experiences, the National Museum is happy to provide that opportunity. So basically with National Museum, so we have different divisions. So where if we get you know, students expressing interest to come and do industrial training, we rotate them to the different sections that we have. So they know what each section is responsible for and there are, you know, involve them in tasks that its offices does and where students can come in to help in the way um, they gain the industrial, say, uh, say um, job experiences that are attached to the respective divisions that we have. So we provide that space, but we also liaise closely with PGIR department. So in that way, um, I think um, that goes to Stephanie's um, question on what type of industrial training we provide. Basically, it's the on-the-job training. So we rotate them to different sections of the museum. And from there, after that, you know, we graduate them to you know, some sort of certificate and we release them back. So should there be an interest with the students that joined us, then they can you know, express that interest and we might employ them, for example. But for the case of job training, we are you know, opening that door to PGIR students. I hope that answers Stephanie's question. Thank you, Ms. Um, we have another a question for Mr. Drew Brower from Navatonia Lomba um, states, do we have national translators who speak international languages? If so, 
how many are there and what international languages do they speak? Thank you very much. Um, um, Related to her question, we, the Department of Foreign Affairs, we attended the language courses uh, conducted by our bilateral partners. So in terms of uh, national translators, we, we do not have a national translator, but officers in the department, they were well trained by our bilateral partners like to do with Japan training, Bahasa training and Mandarin in China. So yes, we do have uh, national translators. Thank you. Um, thank you, Mr. Roa. Another question we have here is from Dr. Aime, I believe. Um, mm -hmm. This question is <coughs> um, how mm -hmm. much is the museum doing to use museum as teaching medium for our students to appreciate the cultural value of objects? Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you, Dr. Aime. Um, in regard to your question, with museum education here, we have different programs tailored for specific audiences. Um, at the moment, let me say it's mostly accessible by um, what must be schools. We have a plan to extend it to the rest of PNG. But um, with regard to museum education programs that we have, um, mostly we have school visits and we have tailored made um, museum education programs specifically for school visits and for um, respective age groups from kindy all the way up to say year 12, even the university students that come here as well. With regard to like outreach, reaching out, um, we have a plan to roll it out to different parts of PNG and, and pretty soon, we have partners that have expressed interest in you know, helping us facilitate that as well. So the population out in the rest of PNG can have access to um, museum education that uh, the museum has in relation to the cultural objects that we have uh, in museums for season. So um, it's a plan in progress, but we hope that we'll achieve that very soon once we get partners on board as well. Thank you, Ms. Hassel, for, uh, for your answer. We hope that, Dr. Amy, we hope that that answers your question. Uh, we'll be moving on to our, uh, our next break. However, for those of you who still feel like you have more questions to ask uh, our speakers who have just spoken to us or Dr. Eliza Ropa who already spoken to us, please use the chat to ask your question and direct it right towards them. And I know they'll be more than happy to answer you. So thank you, Mr. Roa. Thank you, Ms. Hask, for joining us. And also thank you for answering our questions. Thank you so much. Thank you. Now for our wider audience out there, especially for the students who are looking for a place in Divine Word, this, this next pre-recorded video is for you, where information is set out by the registrar's office where students can, or, or potential students can learn more about how they can join the university. Thank you very much. Have you ever thought about applying to study at Divine World University? Then Divine World University may be the choice for you. We offer a range of programs that you can be able to choose from. Say you may be interested to study programs in theology, business and informatics, medicine and health sciences, education, or even arts and social sciences. Most of Divine World University programs are done in full-time study mode, but we do also provide programs that can be done in flexible mode for people who are currently employed. If you are worried about location, do not despair. We have specific programs run at our campuses located in Medang, Rabau, Port Moresby, Tabubil, Wewek, and in Mount Hagen. Diploma holders graduated from Divine Ridge University or other recognized institutions can apply for degree studies if they wish to upgrade their qualification to degree. 
We have three categories of applicants that apply to Ivanra University. These are current grade 12 students who will apply through the national online selection process administered by the Department of Higher Education, Research, Science and Technology. Non-school leavers, past grade 12 students wishing to further their education in a tertiary institution. Working employees, eligible for flexible learning programs. Diploma holders who may want to upgrade their qualification to degree. We are now accepting applications for non-school leavers who wish to study full-time in 2022. The non-school leaver application round for 2022 will close on the 31st of August 2021. The non-school leaver application form can be downloaded on our website. The website also contains information on how to fill in the application form. Current grade 12 students should check the National Online Selection application through the Department of Higher Education, Research, Science and Technology website and read carefully the program information across all institutions and their eligibility to apply for the program of their choice. Interested current employees can choose from a range of programs from the Flexible Learning Center. Please contact us on 422-2937 or why not check out our official website www.dwu.ac.pg for more information on available programs offered at Divine Marie University. We will now have our next guest speaker, who is Brother Martin Knights. Uh, he is the director of in Melanesian Institute in Boroka, Eastern Islands province. Hello, good afternoon. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. First of all, I uh, would like to thank Sister Miriam and the team of the FAS faculty and also for inviting us to join the program, open the program. And also, uh, first of all, I would like also to thank uh, everyone, the program for opening, uh, giving us the content, the content of, of overview, the content of the programs that you have and also the current engagements of the former students. Uh, it is really encouraging to see that the graduates from the Van Wert University um, continue to contribute significantly in, the, uh, in shaping up uh, the country, the churches in Papua New Guinea that is now are uh, experiencing uh, uh, rapid changes. Uh, first of all, I would like just to highlight uh, the work of the Melanesian Institute and then see on whether or not our candidates would be interested to join us in the near future, either as a volunteer, uh, so, uh, contracts or also a long-term uh, employment with the Melanesian Institute. The Melanesian Institute is basically here to help our stakeholders to speak clearly to the, to the needs of people in Melanesia. The stakeholders are the churches, non-government workers, government agencies, and also communities. How do we do our work? We do it through uh, social research, publications, education, basically courses, and the last that uh, in the last five years we introduced is um, community empowerment using participatory action research and also cultural audit. What does it mean? Is basically looking critically to the present situation, the cultural values that are still relevant and revaluing it, and also looking at 
what are the cultural elements that may be helpful in the past, but is no longer uh, helping us in our present situation and how we could address it. So, and listening to the, uh, the training in the Vanuatu University and the interest of the students, I feel really encouraging and I invite you to join us also uh, either as industrial training volunteers or as um, or you see the possibility to work as a full time uh, here in the uh, we in the publication the publication here basically is not only the academic publications but also we use people oriented uh, publications yeah and also the social media, the uh, uh, daily media, and also weekly media. And also there would be a creative um, creative uh, media that can be used. And also you, we do not use only the social applied research, but also the de development work. And I'm happy to hear that you have the flexible learning. You have a program for uh, program development at the flexible learning, that is really encouraging to hear that. And we'd like to work with you in the future and we continue to open the possibility. If I would like to see next year, to see the graduates to come in and join us and see the possibility because at the moment, the Millennium Institute working with the United Nations, uh, the United Nations, the women, you uh, and women, we are also uh, working with the EU and also the churches, the Don Bosco, and also some degree, I know that some of our friends are from DFAT. We also work with them in some degree and assisting the churches uh, through the church partnership program. Um, MI is now becoming a hub, a meeting place for community conversations, for seminars, and apart from courses for the missionaries, for the uh, communities, where you could meet other people from uh, local and international NGOs. We have also uh, uh, the people from the government, uh, PNG, and also we have also diplomatic uh, people coming into our institute for various needs and various uh, conversations. And the staff here is are also open the exposure to these different uh, uh, agencies that could also lead to uh, future uh, work outside the Millennium Institute. Uh, at the moment, we are working with in the peace building. Uh, basically, we're looking at the peace building in Southern Highlands, in Hela, in Porgera, and also Eastern Highlands. So those who are interested to work with the communities, you are welcome. And I believe that the Vanuatu University provide the best academic uh, academic uh, uh, training. And also we would like to look forward that the people who are coming from uh, the university also are independent, flexible and community oriented because we look at our institution is a window for community services. Research, education, publication is a means to promote the work that is happening on the community and also to encourage people to participate, to share our mission. At the same time also, it's like a catalyst to generate some more discussions to create a space for social transform, uh, transformative uh, agendas. So uh, with this, I would like to thank the Divine World University system, Miriam, Miriam and the team for uh, asking us to participate and we'll continue to participate and also um, in some degree, we would like also to um, invite you maybe in the future to be part of our courses, some programs that we run at the Institute, and also to see the possibility that you could also uh, come in to assist us in different ways. And thank you so much and God bless you and look forward for the best for our country, for our communities. Thank you. Thank you, Brother Martin. For those who have, if you have any questions or comments you would like to, uh, if you have any questions you would like to ask for Brother Martin, we will give time later 
at the end of the program for our participants on Zoom. Um, for those who have questions, we're watching live on Facebook. And if you have any questions, you can ask in the comment section on the UDW Facebook page. Uh, without further ado, we'll move on to our next guest for today. Um, our next guest, unfortunately, couldn't be with us today on this Zoom session, but we will be playing a pre-recorded video of him. Um, he is the Archbishop of Mount Hagen uh, Province, Douglas Young. The Vinewood University has many programs that benefit the country of Papua New Guinea and the Pacific region. There are a couple of programs that are of special interest to the Catholic Church in Papua New Guinea and Solomon Islands. They are the religious studies and the social work. The religious studies department has been part of our university from the very beginning. It was responding to a felt need that we needed good teachers in our education system who could deliver a very good, effective, practical and meaningful religious education program. That need continues even today. Even though things have changed with education, uh, there are still needs for people to acquire these kinds of skills of educating in religion not only in schools, but in catechetical programs, in formation programs, programs for youth, for women, for adults, and these days, especially even more so for children, there is a huge need for qualified people who can bring the message of Christ to Papua New Guinea. That need continues. The nice thing about religious studies, of course, is that you begin with an interiorization. It, it's all about your own values. Uh, this is something that you can carry with you throughout your entire life, even if you do change careers at some time. Your faith, your religious knowledge, your understanding of the scriptures, the history of the church, uh, catechesis, the, these things remain with you forever and you can use them in your own family, your community, no matter what work you might be doing. In recent years, the Bishop's Conference has asked the University to please take on a program of social work. And now we've combined those into the two streams of religious studies and social work. The Bishop's Conference felt that this was a real felt need in Papua New Guinea. We did not have professionals who could assist people in trouble, people with alcohol problems or addictions or issues with domestic violence. Uh, the whole area of child protection has come up in recent years. Uh, how to refer people to the help that they have a right to. Uh, the understanding of the laws that govern good down for people in Papua New Guinea. Uh, child protection and women's rights and all of these, even the whole area of human rights, we, we lacked people with the, the kind of background that they needed in law, in counselling, in empathy, in understanding, in skills, even in courage, you might say. Uh, this was a definite need. We had no people who could help people who were in trouble or distress, alcoholics, drug addicts and people like this. There is a big area of need out there, not only in the church but in the public services as well. Uh, public service is constantly looking for child protection officers, it's constantly looking for social workers, the whole area of uh, NGOs. Uh, they are constantly looking for people with this type of skill. Even in industry and in business, they find that uh, they, they can't just concentrate on the process of making money. They have to actually look after their staff and their staff have problems. Uh, the, the staff have problems in the family, in their marriage, at home, in the community. Uh, 
Uh, and these people need to be counseled, they need to be assisted, they need to be referred uh, to places where they can get help. It is a, a big field. Uh, it's not being addressed adequately in Papua New Guinea at the moment. And we really believe that our program at the Vinewood University will help to fill that need. This program also is, is one that is meaningful for the person himself or herself. When you acquire these types of skills, especially to be empathetic and to be able to counsel people and to accompany them and to assist them with concrete advice about their drinking problems or their drug addiction or their domestic violence or their child abuse or things like this, uh, this is so much part of society as a whole that even without a job, there is work to be done. So I would certainly encourage people with, with that kind of interest in life, uh, with that desire not only to serve God, but to serve uh, other people effectively and productively and constructively. Uh, this is the program for you. And I would really encourage you to find out more about it and to enroll if you think that this is the type of thing that you would like to do for the rest of your life. The dioceses need people for child protection, they need qualified youth animators, uh, they need qualified people to accompany Catholic Women's Association, uh, they need people who can, uh, in, in family life in particular, who can assist uh, married people and, and families that are facing difficulty, and especially if they have a good background in uh, scripture and in catechetics because our Catholic programs, of course, Family Life, but also Youth Child Protection, uh, they're not just uh, government programs. Uh, they, they, are, they have an orientation from faith and people respond to that. Uh, they respond warmly if you can uh, bring in a scriptural dimension or a dogmatic dimension or a catechetical dimension to these problems. So the kind of people we are looking for are the kind of graduates that the Vineward University is producing. Uh, people that we can trust, people that we can rely on, people with a good ethical foundation, people with a strong faith, people who, who have interiorized these values. That they're not just professionals with skills, but in a way they, they see it also as a kind of a vocation that this is a gift they have received from God and it is one they want to share with others. So faith would be part of it, uh, skills of empathy, to be able to connect with, with other people, to listen to them. So listening skills, uh, that's all part of empathy, which I've mentioned a few times. Uh, but there are professional skills that go with it, right? uh, to be able to, to know the law, uh, to know the function of the various NGOs, uh, to be able to uh, refer people and to accompany and to uh, assist people to find the kind of help they, they need. Uh, this, this, is, uh, this is the interiorization which comes out in the, in the skills. And that is from Archbishop Douglas Young. Um, he's representing the Catholic Bishop Conference. Also to note, he's also the chair of Divine Red University Council. Uh, we will move on to a three minute poll. So we will be asking um, two questions to our participants on Zoom. If you could kindly answer those two questions that we'll be asking. Uh, if you have any questions for Archbishop Douglas Young, you can ask them and we will forward them to um, Sister Miriam or your lecturers for them to um, answer. Ask him himself and he will answer and return to you. Okay, we'll give three minutes to our participants to answer the poll, if you could do that. 
somehow it doesn't work. We are clicking and it does not work. Maybe whoever is responsible for that helps us, please. Okay, uh, only the attendees will be able to answer the question, but the panelists, you won't be able to um, answer the poll. So this poll is meant for the attendees only. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you everyone for answering. I'm moving on to our next um, segment. We have our industry partners joining us uh, that are connected to the communication arts department. Our first uh, speaker or the industry representative is Mr. Neville Choi. Uh, Mr. Neville Choi is the public relations manager of PNG Mining and Petroleum, and he is also the president of the PNG Media Council. Uh, welcome, Mr. Choi. Yes, good afternoon. I hope you all can hear me clearly. Yes. Yes. Okay. Um, all right. I shall start. If I do, my internet's a bit unstable, so I might turn off my video if and when I need to. Uh, but good afternoon to everyone who's watching or dialing in. Um, the staff and students of the Faculty of Arts and Social Sciences, uh, potential students of the Divine University, industry representatives, colleagues, ladies and gentlemen. Um, I was not able to dial in earlier due to being in another engagement, but I trust you've all been able to listen and engage with the earlier speakers on the program. Uh, thank you to the FASS staff and organizers of this virtual open day for the invitation to share a few perspectives of the media industry and its ever increasing importance and relevance in our country. I know that there are several of my colleagues um, from the current industry that I work in um, which is the mining and petroleum sector. I look forward to their contributions and hope um, being the first speaker of this session to add some value and to prompt some questions that we can probably discuss later. So just as, some, as a matter of background, I currently work as the public relations and communications manager with the Papua New Guinea Chamber of Mines and Petroleum. And while I hold this role in the extractive sector, I, I along with um, Vice President Gregory Moses of NBC and Secretary Belinda Cora of ABC continue to serve as the executives of the Media Council of PNG. There's much to say about where the media industry is right now, but I feel I should draw on experiences of the challenges that journalists face and how these challenges can be addressed. And these challenges, I dare say, cut across both the, the media industry and the extractives uh, to which, um, in which I'm working at the moment. And the first and main challenge is misinformation. So while the credo of quality journalism remains to seek out and establish the truth um, and to present this truth to readers, uh, viewers and audiences in the most unbiased way possible, there is an increasing wave of misinformation that is being packaged in the same way and presented to readers, viewers, and audiences in such forms that actually rival that of traditional news media. And as the line separating credible traditional news organizations from questionable media sources is being encroached on by flashy, by the minute updates from social media fanatics, our people have resorted to placing their faith in individual journalists this recognition is being given based on their following these journalists and media practitioners on social media. So where does this leave traditional media organizations and how can individual journalists who have the benefit of years of practicing their craft contribute to countering misinformation? The first and easiest way is to ensure standards are maintained. And when I refer to standards, I say standards in both written and spoken English, standards in the ways we source and verify information, and standards in the way we decide what is to be posted on social media, either on behalf of the organization we work for and represent, or on our individual media, social media pages. Unfortunately, the average attention span of someone reading an online news article 
is way shorter than that of someone deciding on whether to take the time to pick up a newspaper or to tune into a, a radio or television news broadcast. People today want their news immediately and via any device they deem the most convenient for them. And it is this that is another major challenge for the media today. The need to be first rather than to be factually correct. I mentioned most recently as last Thursday um, at a media training workshop facilitated by the Family Sexual Violence Committee of the Consultative Implementation Monitoring Council or CIMC, the need to attract readers and viewers sometimes beats the need to maintain taste and decency. Um, I know that this is an always present dilemma for news editors and managers across the industry, but a line should be drawn to distinguish whether to continue to sensitize our audiences with images of blood and gore and dismembered corpses or whether to take the time to blur these images and remind them that these are people who have families and friends and who were once active contributors to society. I believe journalists and media practitioners today have a responsibility to uphold traditional media ethics and to continue to remind our people that good does exist and that there are untruths out there that, that are being packaged as the truth that they must be made aware of. Um, I feel that I may be digressing a bit and I'm also mindful that I may have roughly five minutes for my presentations. So I'll, I shall end here. And I, I hope I've been able to add some value to you to the challenges that the media industry faces today. And I'll be available to take any questions that you may have and respond to the best of my knowledge and experience in the industry. Thank you for listening. Thank you, Mr. Mr. Neville Choi for giving us an insight into the challenges of being a journalist in uh, Papua New Guinea today, which is, I must say, it's very insightful that you've given us this information. Now, our next, uh, our next speakers, they're joining us from ExxonMobil, uh, Ms. Melissa uh, Fiery, who is the ExxonMobil Media and Communications Leader, will be leading this uh, presentation from ExxonMobil. Welcome, very uh, welcome to you, uh, ExxonMobil. Hi, good afternoon, everyone. Thank you very much, uh, moderator. Can you hear me clearly? Yes, yes, we can. Wonderful, thank you. So on behalf of my colleague, Dorothy Bengo and I, I would like to take this opportunity to thank you all for giving us this opportunity to join you on your virtual open day. And I believe this is the first so this is wonderful. Um, apology from our colleague, Sam Koyama, whom I believe you have on your um, program. He was supposed to speak as well too, but he had a death in his family, so he won't be with us this afternoon. I'd like to thank Dr. Aime and the Faculty of Arts and Social Sciences for giving us this opportunity to speak to you all this afternoon. I'm just being mindful that, you know, we being the last presenters and energy level gets kind of really, really low at this time. So Dorothy and I will do our best to get through our presentation quickly so you can have your afternoon back. All right, so to start off with, I'll have Dorothy run our presentation. Can we have you just um, allow us to share the screen, please? Of course. Okay, you can share now. Uh, can you all see the screen? Yes, we can. Okay, wonderful. All right, so to start off with, I'll just, I just thought I'll just spend a little bit, just a few seconds on this particular slide, just to give you an overview of the PNG LNG project. So PNG LNG project is operated by ExxonMobil, which you all know, uh, and part of the project, PNG LNG, that is there are five co-venturers um, that are part of the pro project. And there are, um, we have OilSearch, which owns 33.2%. And then we also have Santos with 13.5%, uh, JX Nippon with 
7%. And I've left um, Kumu Petroleum Holdings and MRGC to last because they're both um, state-owned entities. So Kumu Holdings has 29% and MRGC 2.8, sorry, not 29, sorry, 16.8% and MRDC is 2.8%, which totals up to 19.6%, which the government owns as part of the sharing PNG LNG project. With this slide, we're, what we're gonna do is we're gonna just show you a five minute video and it will give you an overview of the PNG LNG project. So some of the things that we're gonna share within the slide, they will be covered in these as well too. So just give us a second and Dorothy will pull that up. Sorry, I'll just give us a second. Almost there. video on our end if there's trouble on your end if that's okay with you okay. is it playing oh i see it's playing okay playing? okay wonderful thank you Uh, we'll play the, we have the video here, so we'll play the video on our end. If that's All right, so that'll be good. Yep, that'll be good. Thank you. commercializing natural gas resources to export as liquefied natural gas. Production of liquefied natural gas, also known as LNG, commenced in April 2014 and is now being delivered to customers in Asia. It is expected that over 9 trillion cubic feet of gas will be produced and sold during the 30-year life of the project. identical drilling rigs were used to drill the production wells in the Hides and Angore fields. The wells extend several thousand meters below the surface to the gas-rich zones. Gas and condensate from the Hides and Angore fields is treated at the Hides gas conditioning plant, which can process 960 million standard cubic feet of gas per day. The plant separates gas, condensate and water and provides compression and pumping facilities to export the gas and condensate via separate pipelines. The heaviest piece of equipment used in the construction of the plant weighed 64 tons. The Como airfield was built to transport very large pieces of equipment required for the construction of the Hydes gas conditioning plant. The airfield is 3.2 kilometers long and can accommodate Antonov airplane the world's largest cargo aircraft. A 292-kilometer onshore gas pipeline transports the conditioned gas from the Hydes gas conditioning plant to the Omati River, where it connects to an offshore pipeline. The pipeline has been buried approximately one meter below ground and has a diameter ranging from 32 to 34 inches. The route passes through a mixture of terrain, including mountain ridges, plateaus, and swamps. Condensate from the Hydes gas conditioning plant is transported via a 109-kilometer condensate pipeline to the Kutubu Central Processing Facility. 
It is then mixed with oil production from the oil fields and transported through the existing oil surge operated pipeline to the Kumul terminal for export. Conditioned natural gas is transported from Omati to the LNG plant near Port Moresby through the 407 km long offshore pipeline. The pipeline was constructed using two installation vessels. The Castoro 10 vessel completed the shallow water section of the pipeline and the CMAC 1 vessel completed the deep water section. The pipeline has a diameter of 36 inches and is weight coated with concrete. In total, 45 vessels were used during the construction of the offshore pipeline. At the LNG plant outside of Port Moresby, gas is converted to liquefied natural gas through two parallel processing trains. The gas is dehydrated and further treated before being cooled down to a temperature cold enough to turn it into liquid form, around minus 160 degrees Celsius. Additional condensate is recovered from the gas during this process. The LNG is then stored in two LNG storage tanks, which each have a capacity of 160,000 cubic meters and is large enough to hold a Boeing 747. When it is ready for shipment, the LNG is piped along a 2.4 kilometer long marine jetty before being loaded onto LNG tankers. The plant will produce approximately 6.9 million tons per annum of LNG. The PNG LNG project will provide a long-term supply of LNG to four major customers in the Asia region including China Petroleum and Chemical Corporation, Sinopec, the Tokyo Electric Power Company, Osaka Gas Company Limited, and CPC Corporation. Around 90 to 100 cargo ships will depart PNG each year. That's one every four days. The PNG LNG project is a joint venture between ExxonMobil PNG Limited and Oil Search Limited, National Petroleum Company of Papua New Guinea, Santos, JX Nippon Oil and Gas Exploration. Mineral Resources Development Company and Petromin PNG Holdings Limited. All right, thanks everyone. We'll just have Dorothy bring back the slides and then we'll go through as quickly as we can. And we hope you found that video uh, informative. You can find that on our website, PNG LNG website, that is. All right, so the PNG LNG project runs through five provinces, Western, Western Province, Southern Islands Province, Ella, Gulf, and Central Province. And literacy level around this space is low in most part of the upstream communities which is about 50%, whilst at the LNG plant site, it's about 90% by comparison. And due to the low literacy level, and also due to PNG being an oral society, communication using oral and pictorial forms such as charts with pictures is recommended when you are doing newsletter in writing especially. But also like to throw in that radio is also a common channel that a lot of our people in the rural communities use for news and information as well too. But with the introduction of so, um, mobile phones, especially and the rural communities are now being exposed to social media, Facebook especially, and this has allowed them to have access to global information and knowledge as well. Now in this slide, you've seen that already in the video, so I'm not gonna spend a lot of time in here, but um, up to 1 billion standard cubic feet of gas is processed each day from so the top image you will see that's the IDES, uh, IDES gas conditioning plant, which is situated up in Hela province. And at the bottom is the pipeline right of way. So you would have also seen the construction of that in the video as well too. So, so that's pretty much what it is in that image. Now, one of the things that I just thought I'll, um, I'll spend a little bit on is uh, infrastructure tax credit scheme, sorry. 
So this is specifically used for infra infrastructure development, particularly at our project um, site areas. And, and this is spent on upgrade of road and also sealing of roads from Tari to Nogoli, which you will see on your left hand image with that nice yellow color there. And also Como being built by the landowner companies, um, which is the AIDS gas development company a new provincial administrative headquarter, which you will see at the bottom, uh, which is being built for Ella provincial government in Tari as well. Now ITC is a joint arrangement added by the Department of National Planning and Monitoring and Department of Works as well, IRC and the developer, which is our PNG LNG project. Some of the examples of where ITC is used is by all search. If, um, if you live in Mosby and you've heard about the National Football Stadium that was built by um, under uh, in infrastructure tax, tax credit, sorry, and also Manasupe House, which houses the prime minister's office as well. Now, some, I'm, I'm just gonna go quickly into this one here. Some of the projects that we are also supporting under domestic market obligation is the PNG LNG project supplying power to Port Mosby City. So that's about 25 megawatts um, to the Port Mosby grid. And this started in 2015 uh, with the assistance to when we had the Pacific Games and later on um, in 2019 as well too. So the PNG LNG project also supplies um, uh, gas to new power project, which is about 58 megawatt output and a joint venture. And this is a joint venture between Oil Search and Kumo Petroleum Holdings Limited. The Dero Power is a similar project has 45 megawatt output. And this is yet to come online. Uh, it's owned by MRDC. Um, and soon MRDC will partner with Ella Provincial Government to venture into a similar project uh, up at the Ides area as well. So again, this was in the videos. I'll just go quickly through that. Um, on the left, you will see is an image of our um, wells in the Ides area. So there are about seven well pads up at Ides. And on the right, you will see the Como airfield, which was also in the video as well too. So this was built specifically for the construction of the project and in, it landed the biggest um, cargo carrier in the world, which is anti, 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 sorry, Antinov as was mentioned in the video. And again, this was in the video, so I'm not gonna um, spend time on this one. We'll move on to the next one. So with the LNG plant site, which is just based outside of Port Mosby, it, re it receives natural gas from Hyde's uh, conditioning plant via pipeline. There are two LNG trains um, of which 160,000 cubic meters um, LNG storage tanks and marine loading terminal is also situated down there. So you'll see the bottom image, that's, that's the marine terminal itself. And um, it, the LNG plant capacity as of, um, the capacity of producing an equivalent of 8 million tons of LNG each year and um, growing and investing local communities is also some of our focus in the plant side communities in that space. Now moving on to this slide, uh, under one of the things that we are also focused in is national content program and there are three focus areas for us workforce development supply development and also strategic community investment. The project itself during construction, there were 10,000 Papua New Guineans that have worked on the project uh, production workforce now sits at about 2,600 of which 96% are Papua New Guineans and around 210 operations and maintenance trainees we have at this stage uh, and about 2.2 million hours of training has been delivered to our staff. Now, as stated in our national content supplier development is one area that we focused on. So since construction, we have spent about 15 billion kina on services and goods that are provided by the Papua New Guinea companies, of which around 18,000 local businesses have assisted and more than 29 training days have been provided to the PNG LNG uh, created entrepreneur, uh, sorry, enterprise center, which is situated down at IBBM at Conedobo. 
So education is one space that we are also very uh, passionate about um, to strengthen education. We have uh, scholarship programs. We have built teaching teacher capacity through trainings, or teacher, teaching materials, and also have built houses as well for teachers. We have built classrooms um, for both upstream, downstream um, communities, and also uh, for communities around the plant site areas outside of what must be. Building leadership and administrative capacity for the teachers is also very important to us as well to enable them to do their job. And also one of the things that we do is um, supporting STEM programs, a science ambassador, which is one of our flagship program where our staff volunteer their time to go out into the community and also schools in Port Mosby to talk to the students about science, technology, engineering, mathematics to encourage children to consider STEM as a career in the future. Again, health is another area that we are also focused in. So building health infrastructures and capacities in communities, working with PNG Institute of Medical Research to help implement public health initiatives, partnering with our Texas Children's Hospital to improve pediatric maternal and public health capacity. We have been supporting the government with the pandemic response as well. So we have uh, delivered 10 tons of food. Uh, and also I'm not gonna go to the stats that are up there, but you can see that yourself. And our staff have been volunteer, have volunteered in some of these so the packing of foods and PPEs for frontline workers as well. So we have been supporting in that space. Women's empowerment is one area that we are also passionate about. So we've also, apart from that, we have been supporting livelihood improvement programs in our communities, food and hygiene and nutritional trainings, livestock management, and also have been providing financial literacy training as well too. So environment in this space, BNG LNG project supports the conservation of the um, some of the endangered species like piku, if you have heard. So piku is a pygmy turtle from the um, Kikori River Basin area. And if you have been to the Port Mosby Nature Park, you would have seen um, uh, Port Mosby Nature Park supporting us with this. So they've got a space there that they have for this. So piku conservation project is um, educa educating communities about endangered pygmy turtles. Uh, in August 2019, about 15 turtles from the program were released back into the wildlife once they had reached uh, 15 centimeter in length. And also new frog species, which was named after one of our own um, uh, Papua New Guinean, Anita Mosby, and the, um, the frog species is called Copula Mosby. And our regeneration monitoring efforts are done through our collaboration with uh, environmental NGOs, New Guinea Binatang Research Center. Also, we conduct research program to study dolphins and dugons in the Kikori Delta area. And as I mentioned, Port Mosby Nature Park um, is also one of our uh, supporters in biodiversity and educational program for school, school children as well too. So that um, wraps up our presentation. Uh, most of the stuff that we've shared with you, you can get this from our website here. Um, and also our Facebook as well. Next slide, please. And these are some of the materials. Again, these are all on our Facebook as well too. So you can get some of this information from there. And these are some of the partners that we work with. So that wraps it up for us with our presentation. Thank you very much, everyone. And we'll end it there. If you have any questions, I'll throw it over to my colleague, Dorothy, and she can assist in it. Thanks, everyone. OK, thank you very much, the team from ExxonMobil. Now we have time for a few questions. However, before we move on, I believe uh, Mr. Neville Troy has uh, answered a question, but he would like to expand a bit more on the question asked by one of our students. Uh, he can answer that question during this time. Uh, yes, thanks very much. Um, I got two questions. I think the first one was from Benjamin 
And I think Benjamin's question was um, what the role of the media is in, in developing in the development of the country. Um, I, I think that's pretty self-explanatory. Um, it, it involves a lot of things, but I think the main thing that the media, um, the role, the main role that the media plays is to be the voice, uh, the eyes and ears of the people. Um, not just that, I think today you'll find that people are hungry to get involved in, in national politics, in, in matters of um, national um, relevance. And you'll, that the role of the media today is, is even more important, I think. Um, you'll, I'll, let me just give some examples. So in the past week or so, since parliament resumed, we've had the post career, for example, running what they've referred to as a roll call of attendance of members of parliament. Now, what's that? what that has eventuated in is the members of parliament have realized that, that, um, that, that somebody is taking note of whether they are appearing in parliament and speaking on the behalf of the people who voted them. So that has, has resulted in members of parliament making it a point to arrive, in, arrive early at parliament and even leave caucus meetings to make sure that they're in the chamber uh, in, the, uh, in the danger of you know, being recorded as being absent or late to the chamber. So different, the role the, the, role the media plays is multifaceted, but I think things like that directly affect the way that our citizens um, either react or interact with their local members the people who make decisions for them. Um, the way, um, it empowers uh, people in communities to stand up and, uh, for what is right and to do the right thing rather than, rather than not have a voice and not have an opinion about anything. So that's just one aspect of it. But I think the media has, needs to become, in, especially during this age of, of misinformation uh, around examples like COVID, I think the media plays a more important role um, I hope I've answered that one, Benjamin, but if you have any follow-up questions, um, I would expect you to if you're a journalism student. Um, but if you have any follow-up questions, I'd be happy to answer them again. Um, Stephanie, Stephanie had a question about how the Media Council contributes to providing in-house training. Okay, case in point would be um, during Media Freedom Day this year, um, we worked with, the, with TIPNG, Transparency International, to launch the Investigative Journalism Award. So we don't directly provide training for individual newsrooms. What we do is we try and work with um, stakeholders and partners and identify or to get all the media, media newsrooms or the media organizations to nominate their, their reporters to their building up, who either they're building up or to provide experienced journalists and reporters to become facilitators for, for, for training workshops ranging from, like I mentioned earlier in my presentation, um, the Family Sexual and Violence um, Committee under the CIMC. So that particular workshop last week, the we ran over two days was to educate young journalists in, in the mainstream today about how to report on, on instances of domestic violence, family violence, um, how to refer effect, uh, effectively and more importantly to to victims and, and instead of saying, referring to them as victims, referring to them as, as survivors. Uh, that's another point, you know, the language that the media uses. So because, because people pay much, pay close attention to the media, they tend to believe everything the media says. So it's a big, even bigger responsibility on the media to make sure that the language they use doesn't either influence citizenry in, in a negative way rather than a positive way. Um, I hope I've answered that question. So in short, we don't directly deal with, um, with training. The Media Council doesn't directly deal with training in each of the newsrooms. What we do is we try to get everybody together and, 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 and target them in the right direction for training that they say they may need. Uh, and I think an example which um, Melissa and Dorothy would be able to um, shed more light on or explain further is the Chamber of Mines and Petroleum recently held a, um, a community affairs and business development and media workshop. And in that media workshop, we, we, got, um, we got representatives from the media to attend um, specific social media training that ExxonMobil was facilitating. And, and that was how to engage, increase engagement on social media with, with, uh, with their audiences. 
how to be more visible as individual journalists. And, and I think that, that really worked well for the journalists also who learned a lot, not just about social media and how to use it more effectively, but also about the extractives industry and what they do for local impact communities. Um, I think Dr. Raime had, had a question. Oh, I think he was making a point. He agreed that social media was beating mainstream media by, prov by providing news, which is very unchecked. Mainstream media need to best unpack and deliver the public to the public newsworthy stories that carry some resemblance of truth. Um, I totally agree with Dr. Aime. Um, and that's the whole reason why we try to focus our training around um, dealing more with social media. You'll note that each of the, each of the media organizations does have an online team, a new uh, online news team. And each of the different organizations would probably have stakeholders that they interact with who provide um, training for their online teams to increase their capacity and knowledge. Uh, I think I'm, I probably just, probably just answer first before Melissa and Dorothy answer Dr. Aimee's latest question about how communication arts students could apply and what types of jobs are available. Um, so outside of what, what the journalism departments can do is contact um, individual newsrooms and assess what sort of capacity they have to take on, um, take on journalism students who need to um, have some sort of practical experience as part of their curriculum. Uh, that's been working well and I think you can just look at NBC and MTV to see some of your former uh, student colleagues who are now in the mainstream. Um, and I'll leave probably Melissa and um, Dorothy to expand on how Exxon can contribute to that. I hope I've answered questions. If there are any more, please just um, post them on the chat and I'll see what I can, see if I can help further. Thanks. All right. Um, I guess before I answer the question about uh, how do you apply for, um, if you're a communication student, how do you apply or a job with ExxonMobil. So I'll just go back to Neville's uh, comment on social media and how we are working with um, uh, Neville in his capacity with the uh, chamber and also with the media council. And then it also goes back to Dr. Imes' question about social media. You know, social media is putting out so many news there, breaking news every now and then. How do you know what is fact and what is not? So we saw that and we thought, okay, how do we help our, because you know, we can't go directly to the journalists and, and media organizations and say, how can we help you run a training program for you? So we, we wanted to piggyback on, you know, Neville on whether it's chamber or media council and see how we can assist in the space. So we've done two different um, social media training or three, I would say. So, and they've all been with Neville. Uh, first one was in early January with the media, um, local media. And again, it's to help them to, you know, see what, how they can best utilize that particular platform, but also realize that, you know, a lot of the information out there are not factual. And if you recall earlier, when I spoke about um, our project running to five different provinces and mobile, uh, mobi mobile being introduced in the country, people have access to information now, especially Facebook, whether it's true or not, people are hungry for news. So one of the challenges that we journalists have is to make sure that we cross check our facts. And when we say cross check fact, it's not just to read now and go, okay, that person has this credibility, so I should go and do this story. No, you have to check every person that is associated with that particular um, person and then verify that that story is true before you go and publish it because it's not just the people that are following you that are reading the story it's going to get shared with everyone else so also international media is also looking as well too so be mindful of that uh, moving on to uh, the question in regard to uh, students um, how you can apply and hi Katie thank you for that question nice question uh, so unfortunately for this year, it has closed. Usually what you can do is you can apply to a graduate management program um, and that opens around June and closes in August. And, and for this year's intake that has closed. So you would probably read the advert and go, okay, it doesn't say public relations or communications or media. We, what Dorothy and I didn't do when we started off is to introduce ourselves. So Dorothy and I are ex-divine words and 
we both work for public and government affairs department. And under the department, we have media and communications team. So both Dorothy and I are in that team. Um, so when you apply in that program, you will see it will say it's public and government affairs. So you can apply through that and then you can get, um, you go through a program, so you get rotated. And then eventually a lot of the people that come to public affairs, they sit under our team and work. So um, last year we had a young lady from, uh, from Unitech, I would say she studied a, sorry, Dorothy, what was it that she studied? She studied uh, to do with community. Um, it's more like public, really, uh, sorry, P PNGA, I would say, they're at Divine Word or PGA, sorry if I get it wrong, and international, similar to that. So she studied that and then she also came through the program and she spent 12 months with us and she just finished off in June and moved on to the next program. So I hope I answered that question. All right. And we also, sorry, we also have that on our Facebook when the um, program is advertised and also on our website as well too. So look out for it come around June um, next year. Okay, thank you. Uh, due to time, we'll move on to our next question asked to Mr. Jude Roa by Diane Rose. Um, are there any plans on creating a foreign affairs GDP 2020 and 2022? And what are the recruitment strategies like? Okay, thank you so much for that question. Uh, the department is currently working on it, given that we have uh, currently issues at the moment on capacity and resources. And our recruitment strategies and policies is supported by the department's staff development policy where it provides a clear career path for officers, but the department at the moment uh, have an influence from the Department of Personal Management because they control all the government agencies are uh, their human resources. And to do with the recruitment processes in the department, you can um, express your interest to our HR um, branch in the department through our corporate service division and express your interest to join with the department, but it will depend on your, um, the content of your course. Yeah, I think that's all for me. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Mr. Ro, for answering our students' questions. Now, uh, we've learned a lot throughout this, this session, starting from Dr. Eliza, all the way down to the Edson Mobile team. We are very fortunate to hear about all these. As a student, personally, it's great to hear about all these different pathways, which is open for me and the other students of the university and faculty as well. So we are very grateful for all the industry partner representatives who have joined us. We're thankful for your insight. And if next year comes, we will also be doing something like this. So we look forward to seeing you all again. Uh, next year. Now we move on to our to the closing remarks by the president of the Divine Red University, Father Philip Gibbs, who has joined us as well. And we ask him that he's going to give us our closing remarks. Okay, I'll, uh, thank you very much. Uh, if I can just um, see myself there, I'll be able to get my picture up as well. Start my video. Here we go. Can you hear me? Yes. Great. Look, um, this year has been an amazing year. Um, we normally have open day around May. And with COVID around, uh, we realized that we just couldn't do that. And um, people wanted to cancel it. And um, some, including myself, said, no, let's do it differently. And so we decided to do it like we have done today. Um, and, and so uh, a lot of work went into that. And I really want to say a big thanks to all the people who have put so much hard work into this uh, day that we've had today. I've been sitting here at my desk since quarter past eight this morning. I took a little break at lunchtime. Uh, but I've been here since quarter past eight this morning, sitting right here, watching everything, and it's all really quite amazing. 
So thank you to the Faculty of um, Education, the Faculty of Medicine and Health Sciences, the Faculty of Business and Informatics, uh, Arts and Social Sciences, the people from the Center for, uh, um, for Learning and Teaching, for the IT people, for all the committees that did so much hard work, the people like Deborah Pranis, who was running around getting things organized. Um, uh, it's, uh, I can't mention everybody, but if you've had some part to play in this, then consider yourself um, thanked um, on, from, from my part. Uh, uh, whether it's been worthwhile and successful or not, I think depends on how open it has been today. Uh, how many people has it reached? I think it's reached a lot of staff and students. At one stage, I saw there were about 70 people on uh, Zoom and there are equal number on Facebook. Uh, how many people outside of the university have been able to access and listen to what we've been saying and seeing what we've prepared today? Uh, that's the big question that's in my mind. And um, so, uh, we'll, we'll, we'll be hearing about that, no doubt, in the coming week or so when we analyze um, the statistics from today. But I would like to say a big thanks to those from um, other parts, um, those of you who have been speakers outside of the university, who have been invited to uh, participate today and who have spoken um, to us and answered questions, and it's been really good. Uh, even you there, Elisa, all the way from Australia, not just um, Papua New Guinea. So um, I, I just like to um, really appreciate everyone that's put so much time into this uh, today. From my point of view, uh, it's been a worthwhile uh, attempt at doing things differently. What will happen next year? It's hard to say. We're going to have to evaluate it. We'll see what is the situation with the health and um, uh, situation with COVID next year uh, and how we're going to approach um, presenting ourselves to the world, which is what we're doing here in Open Day and uh, looking at uh, possibilities for our students, um, especially when they, uh, with their careers and, um, and also in terms of that uh, theme that uh, we had for this year at the university and which was our basic theme today, which was the language that everybody understands is the language of love. So with that, I'd like to, um, to finish and thank you for letting me say a few words uh, at the end of this um, wonderful day that we've had today. Uh, thank you very much everybody and God bless you all. Now, um, I know a lot of us have a lot of questions to ask our speakers. Unfortunately, the time cannot allow us to directly ask it, but our representatives have given their contact information, which I know a lot of the students would like to go ahead and uh, ask. And I know that all the representatives from the different industries will be more than happy to answer your questions. Uh, to our audience from Facebook, the public, we are thank very thankful that you've joined us and we look forward to seeing you all. And yes, um, thanks again to our industry partners who made the time to time out of their busy schedule to come and speak to us today for our virtual open day. And once again, thank you, Dr. Eliza Ropa, Brother Martin, um, Archbishop Douglas Young, Mr. Neville Choi, um, Melissa Fiery, Miss Dorothy Bengal, Miss Loretta Asu, and Mr. Jude Roa for speaking to us and the students um, today. And thank you to our viewers online who are watching. Thank you for viewing. And thank you to our participants on Zoom. Uh, thank you for being with us today. Um, yes, another announcement. We have voting will be done at the end of this session. So to our 
participants on Zoom and those who are watching live on Facebook, please, after this session, do not forget to go on the Divine Road University Facebook page and vote for the faculty that you think did the best on this virtual open day. So after this Zoom session, you can go and visit the Divine Road University Facebook page and place your votes for the best faculty that you think um, did well for this year's virtual open day. And with that, I now say thank you and bye.